House of Israel International Services are held weekly at 3601 Rose Lake Drive, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28217, 11 a.m. Saturday mornings and 7 p.m. Thursday evenings, Eastern Time. This live broadcast is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Your financial support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Motivating. Inspiring. Challenging. Encouraging. Deepening. Strengthening and enhancing your faith. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to House of Israel International's live worship service. So let's get into the teaching tonight. We're going to be talking or dealing with 1 Peter, and we're going to read uh, the first few verses in 1 Peter and get right to the chase. Is that all right with y'all? 1 Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout the Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of Jehovah the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Messiah Yeshua. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the Elohim and Father of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Yeshua Messiah from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of Elohim through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Yeshua Messiah, whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Which, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Messiah, which was in them, did signify, when it testified be beforehand the sufferings of Messiah and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. And so we're going to stop there because what we've looked at is we've looked at two contexts. We've looked at the introduction and then we've gone or the um, identifying of who uh, Peter is and uh, who he's writing to, and then the um, opening of First Peter and Epistle of Peter. And so we're going to pick up in verse one, and the uh, verse says, "Peter, an apostle of Yeshua Messiah," and then he identify who he's writing to, to strangers, scattered, and where are they scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, this is modern-day Turkey if you were to look at it on a map. And by the time Peter writes this letter, the saints had been scattered. Now, as we go through the Bible, we know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John introduces Acts because 
the gospel narratives is where Yeshua starts his ministry, call his disciples, uh, reveal to them their commission, their purpose, the plan, and then he ascends, the Holy Spirit is given, and they begin their ministry work. We get to about eighth chapter of Acts, and we find that unfortunately, <laughs> the disciples aren't necessarily doing what the Messiah called them to do, and that is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. They were to start where? Jerusalem, and then to where? Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. Now, you will see a pattern here, ladies and gentlemen, because we know that when we look at where Israel is, it is no accident that it is referred to as the Middle East, because where Israel is, it connects the African nations and the European nations. Now, where Judea is, if if you look at what Yeshua is saying, there seems to be something that, that he, he is pointing them in a particular direction. See, Judea, the direction he's pointing them to is kind of like up into Europe because Judea is at the southernmost part of Israel and right at the end of Israel, you're into what? Egypt. And Egypt is North Africa, and then there's Libya. I mean, and then you go down further, and you're in the continent of Africa. But he's pointing from Judea, then north to, well, from Ju Jerusalem, Judea, and then Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world, which is where it seems as if the disciples begin their ministry work. And so, you've heard me say that when it comes down to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that Shem and Ham are throughout the Bible, from Genesis all the way up to Malachi, we see that there is an interaction between Shem and Ham. But when it comes down to Japheth, the European nation, the gospel, which the descendants of Abraham are already seemingly operating in according to the commands, according to the promises that going in the direction of Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world, it appears that the disciples went north. Can you see this? Now, you say, well, why does that matter? Well, let's, let's look. We, we know that in Acts chapter 8, the disciples, the apostles, were still in Jerusalem. Now, in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, uh, the Feast of Weeks, had come. Folks had come up, some had been filled with the Spirit, and then they went off back to their places of origin. But Yeshua said to his disciples before he ascended, he says, you have to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. You have to start in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then the uttermost. And what happened is that the apostles, by the time you get to Acts chapter 8, they're still in Jerusalem. And so something takes place in chapter 7 where Stephen is stoned. The clothes of Stephen is laid at Saul's feet. And from that point on, a major persecution took place among the believers, which caused them to scatter. And this is what happened. So now it appears that the Almighty brings persecution 
in order to get the people of Israel, the children of Israel, to do what he called them to do. Now, I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Without persecution, we get complacent. Without a little pressure, sometimes we get relaxed, we get settled, and we can get kind of lazy. It appears that the disciples were comfortable doing ministry in Jerusalem, but the persecution came, and it was at the hand of a young man named Saul, which later becomes Paul. In verse 1 of chapter 8, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except who? <laughs> the apostles. The apostles were still staying in Jerusalem. The others were scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria. But the apostles, they stayed. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the assembly, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to some the city of Samaria. Now, there was an apostle Philip, but this wasn't him. This was a fellow by the name of Philip who was chosen in Acts chapter 5 to be a deacon or chapter 6. I believe it was chapter 6. Let me make sure I get my books right. So it was Acts chapter number, who can tell me? The deacons were chosen in what chapter? It was chapter number 6. In Acts chapter 6, Ananias and Sapphira were stoned in Acts chapter 5. And by Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned. Acts chapter 8, they're carried away. Acts chapter 9, Paul gets converted. But in Acts chapter 6, um, there was a fellow by the name of Philip. And you will find him... In verse number five, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Philip. And so this Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Messiah unto them. And here is a map where if you were to look at this area where they were scattered, you can see Bithynia. You'll see Bithynia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, and this is Asia Minor, where you will find the seven ecclesias or the seven um, um, assemblies that Revelation was addressed to. And this today, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Russia is up here. This is Turkey. This is modern-day Turkey where we are, what we see here today. Now, what's interesting is that this, this entire area, ladies and gentlemen, is controlled by Islam, various sects of Islam, where at one point it was controlled or inhabited by believers in Messiah Yeshua. Before we get into Peter, we want to get an understanding of who Peter is. Because if we understand Peter, then we would be better off understanding his writings when he writes. The gospel and Acts reveal much information about Peter and about his family. Now, interesting, Peter is referred to by six names in the Bible. And this is one of those things as a simple-minded person. I like consistency. You give me consistency, I can follow you. But there are times when I'm looking at names and it's like, okay, there, Peter is referred to by six names. Why? But, hey, I didn't write the Bible. If I did, I would write it a lot simpler and people would be, it would be easy to follow. But the way it is, is that it requires a little study. So now, Peter is referred to as the name Simon. He's referred to as Simon Peter. He's referred to as Simon Barjona, as Peter, as Cephas, and Simeon. Now, there are other Simeons in the Bible. 
There are other Simons in the Bible. And yet, when you see Simon, you can't assume that it is Simon Peter. But we see that Peter is referred to by these six names. Now, here, we're going to find that Peter's Hebrew name is Simon. Peter's Hebrew name is Simon. And when we see Peter's Hebrew name as Simon, we also see that he was called Peter. And Matthew chapter 4 says, And Yeshua walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter. Simon called Peter. And Andrew, his brother. So we see here that Simon had a brother named Andrew. And they were casting a net into the sea. Why? Because they were fishers. They were fishers. Fishermen, as we would say. Peter and his brother Andrew were both disciples of Yeshua. Matthew 10, 2. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon. And interesting, whenever, Paul, whenever Peter is mentioned in conjunction with the disciples or apostles, it seems that Peter is always first. And so it says, the first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Then there's James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So James and John was brothers. Simon, Peter, and Andrew were brothers. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. And it was John who told Andrew and another disciple, that they should follow Yeshua. And it was Andrew who knew or knew of Yeshua first. He went and find Peter and bring Peter to Yeshua. John chapter 1 verse 40. One of the two which heard John the Baptist, the Mercer, speak and followed him, Yeshua, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, Yeshua. And when Yeshua beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Now, the reason why Simon is called Bar-Jonah is Bar means son of Jonah. Simon, son of Jonah. And here, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas. Now, Simon means rock or stone, and Cephas means stone, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following Yeshua would go forth into Galilee and find it Philip and say unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And so we find that Philip, Andrew, and Peter came up in the same place. Yeshua changed Simon's name to Cephas or Kephas. Did I put that in? Yeah, I did. Cephas or Kephas. Some people refer to him as Kepha. Cephas or Kephas. And he brought him to Yeshua, and then Yeshua beheld him, and he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which again, by interpretation, is what? A stone. So Yeshua called him Peter. So he called him Simon. He called him Cephas. He called him Simon by Jonah. But he also called him Peter. And I say unto thee thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter was listed among the twelve apostles as Peter. Matthew 10, 2 again. 
Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now I want you to notice here that there is Simon the Canaanite, and there is Simon called Peter. So there are two disciples, apostles, with Yeshua, whose name is Simon. The distinction, Simon called Peter, and Simon the Canaanite. Interesting. One day we're going to look into Simon the Canaanite. <laughs> Peter was his surname. Simon was his name. The names were used together in verse 16 of Matthew. And Simon Peter answered and said, and this is when Messiah asked, who do men say I am? And who, then he said, well, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. Peter's father's name, it should be an apostrophe. Peter father's, Peter's father's name was what? Jonah. Yeshua called him Simon Bar-Jonah, meaning Simon, son of Jonah. And Yeshua answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Bar-Jonah equals son of Jonah. Now, I'm pointing all this stuff. I know for some people this is so elementary. But it wasn't elementary when I started reading the Bible. I mean, it was like all these Simons and Peters and Barjonas. It's like, who is what? And it took a while to kind of figure that out, figure that out. And so I'm, I'm laying this out because I know that there are a lot of new people coming into the faith who are reading the Bible who may not have the knowledge that you all have and are too afraid to ask questions. Now, I say to people, you shouldn't be afraid to ask questions, but we can say that all day long. It don't stop people from being afraid to ask questions. They do. And the reason I found the number one reason for me to not ask questions is because I didn't want to appear ignorant. How many of you know ignorant and stupid is two different things? Being ignorant means you simply lack knowledge. It's a big difference than being stupid. I don't, I try not to use the term stupid, but ignorant folks, there are many things that I'm ignorant of. And I don't boast or brag on it, I just acknowledge fact. I'm ignorant of how televisions work. I'm ignorant of how cars work. Now, people can explain it to me. Folks have tried to explain, I'm ignorant as to how to play the piano, but David is not. You see, there are things that I just simply lack the knowledge of. Doesn't mean that I'm unintelligent. I have intelligence in other areas. I just don't have the intelligence in that area. So as ignorance is nothing to be ashamed of. But when it comes to ignorance of the Bible, that's something that can be easily overcome. And it's important that we overcome it because the word of Jehovah is the word of life. It's this book. And it contains life itself. It's a living book. James called Peter Simeon. In Acts chapter 15, it says, And after that, they heard their peace, they held their peace. James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And what he's referring to is here, Peter, he was on a rooftop having, um, taking a nap, waiting for dinner. 
And it seems like every time I take a nap waiting for dinner, I think about Peter. <laughs> you know, I've laid there waiting and, you know, you could kind of doze off and then the wife comes and say, hey, honey, dinner's ready. But Peter was dozing off. And one of the reasons why I'm pointing these things out is it took me a long time, a long, long, long time to recognize that the people of the book were no different than you and I. And it is so important that we pull the covers off because for a long time, I saw the people in the Bible as super beings. They, you know, they, they didn't have superpower, but you could tell me they didn't have superpower because as far as I'm concerned, I look at some of the, they, they had the opportunity to be with the Messiah. You got the prophets who heard directly from the Almighty. They did exploits, and I'm reading about these individuals, and these individuals seem like superheroes. And the movies, you know, make them superheroes, and um, the stories that people, people speak, and they embellish or they say it things in such ways to where those people of the Bible, those were great men and women. When the fact of it, those great men and women were us. They're no different than you and I. And as I began to pull the, the covers back, I began to see the humanness of these individuals, their frailties. I began to see that, you know, Peter could have been my brother. Paul could have been my brother. You see, I could have been him. Or there's very little difference between them and us. And that's important because the book of Acts is still being written. People say, well, the Bible is complete. Just because it's got a, a cover on it, it can't be complete because Yeshua is still waiting to come. There are things in this book that has not yet been fulfilled. So how can it be complete? It's not complete because the book of Acts don't end with Paul in a rented house. The apostles, but see people who say, well, you know, there's no more apostles, there's no more prophets, you know, the Holy Spirit don't do what the Holy Spirit used to do. And I say, you know, that's, that's unbelief talking. And so I have to reject that unbelief. Now, the moment I reject that unbelief, it puts responsibility on me. Well, if these things still operate, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you walking in the authority of the Holy Spirit? Why aren't you walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? Why aren't you manifesting the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Why aren't the fruit of... Be and, and then people, you know, it's confusing. And I say... Church people confused me. I'm just going to put it out there like it is. They just confused me because it's like talking out both sides of your mouth. In one sense, the Holy Spirit is still at work, but in other senses, the Holy Spirit is not at work. I'm supposed to manifest the fruit of the Spirit, but I can't operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And so it's, it's, it's confusing, you know what I'm saying? And then over there, these people take it to the extreme on one end, and you go to that denomination, and they take it to the extreme on a totally different um, end, and it's just, so you have to pull away from all of that and say, Father, you know, I've learned from those people, and I've learned from those people, and I'm still confused. You just got to teach me, because what I read and what I see is two totally different things. And, and I can't read. If, if, if I say I believe this book, why am I following these people whose behavior is contrary to the book? But if I follow the book, I look crazy. If I do the stuff that's in the book, I look like I'm off. I look like I'm the one who joined the cult. You see. <laughs> and it got to the point for me, it's like, yeah, well, you know, they're in a cult. 
They say you're in a cult because you're following the book. They're in a cult. They're not following the book. So a cult is someone who subscribes to a doctrine and follow a leader. I say, okay, well, I guess I am in a cult. My cult leader's name is Yeshua. <laughs> so I might as well follow my cult leader, you know, cultishly. <laughs> Peter was from Bethsaida, but lived in Capernaum. And both of these locations, when we do our tours in Israel, we go to them, Bethsaida and Capernaum. And we see here in Mark chapter 1, they went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. That's verse 21, verse 28 through 30. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Now in verse number 21, they went into the synagogue, right? In verse number 29, and forthwith when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew. So it seemed like Simon and Andrew lived together. And where did they live? In Capernaum. But they were from Bethsaida. And so it seems as if Simon didn't live too far from a synagogue in, 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 in uh, Capernaum. They entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife. So we see something else about Simon Peter. Peter was married. Simon's wife, mother, it, it seemed like his mother-in-law lived with him, lay sick of a fever and she was ill. And Anon, they tell him of her. Now here, you can see the Sea of Galilee, which we go. There's Tiberias. Bethsaida is on one side, and this is, this is going toward this is going north, where we're seeing Syria and Lebanon and up. We see that Capernaum is on one side of the Sea of Galilee at the tip, Lake Genesaret, and Bethsaida is on the other side. And up, up in here you'll find Caesarea Philippi and in, 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 uh, this is where Simon was born, Bethsaida, and this is where he was living in Capernaum. Simon was married, as we see, and forthwith when they would come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John, but Simon's wife, mother, lay sick. Peter denied that he knew Yeshua three times. Now this is this was had to be tough to overcome. In Matthew in Mark chapter 14 it says, And Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not. Neither understand I want thou neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch and the cock crew. And a maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. This is one of those followers of Yeshua. And he denied it again. And a little after they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for thou art a Galilean. And thy speech agreeeth thereto. So now you see, here they are in Jerusalem. But Peter, being from Capernaum and Bethsaida, may have had a little northern draw, draw. You know, like some, you know, folks here in the Carolinas, who were born here talk a little bit different than the people who came here from the north unless they come further south and so there is a difference in the speech and it was recognizable by those who heard Peter speak but he began to curse now now he's using profanity in vulgar, vulgar language 
I don't know him. I don't know this man of whom you speak. And this time, the second time, the cock crew. And Peter called to mind the word that Yeshua said unto him before the cock crows thrice, you shall deny me thrice. Before the cock crows twice, you shall deny me three times. And when he thought thereon, he wept. And so here we see Peter denying Messiah, but we also see Yeshua restoring Peter after his resurrection. John 21, 14. This is now the third time that Jesus, or Yeshua, showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Yeshua said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lamb. Now it's interesting that he says, Love me more than these. Because prior we find that he goes fishing, he brings out all these fish. And what was Peter? A fisherman. And what did Peter do once he Messiah was crucified? He went back to fishing. So it's obvious that fishing was his livelihood, fishing was his business, but it also seemed that Peter enjoyed fishing. And now Messiah is saying, you love, you lo do you love me? more than you love your work? Do you love me more than you love your business? Do you love me more than that which you seem to love? And he says, yeah, Lord, you know that I love thee. He said unto him, feed, feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, love, do you love me? He said unto him, yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. He said unto him, feed my sheep. And he said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. You know that I love thee. Yeshua said unto him, feed my sheep. Peter apparently did missions work with his wife. Now this is a little strange for some people because here we find Peter and his wife doing mission work together. And this we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 5. Now, the Bible doesn't give us, show us Peter, but we know this from what Paul wrote. He says, don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brother and Cephas? And so we find that James and Cephas and the other apostles, when they traveled, that it appeared that their wives traveled with them. Now, I particularly pointed out that Paul, I mean Peter, in this map, we find that they were born um, in Bethsaida. Now, this is the northern part of Israel. And they lived in Capernaum. But after Peter restored, after Yeshua restored Peter, it appeared, if I could have it on a map here, Jerusalem is way down here off the map that now Peter has relocated to Jerusalem. So he lived in Bethsaida, or he was born in Bethsaida. He moved to Capernaum, but then he relocated to Jerusalem, which is probably why his wife went with him on certain journeys, because now they've relocated. They're no longer in the fishing, fish business, but they're in the fisher of men business. And it appears that when he went out, that his wife went along with him. So, we see Peter discipled Mark. Now, the, the, the gospel writer Mark, there were two gospel narratives that were written by individuals who were not disciples of Yeshua, Mark and Luke. Mark was not a disciple of Yeshua, 
neither was Luke a disciple of Yeshua. But yet they wrote a gospel narrative of Yeshua's life, which indicates that they had to get it from an eyewitness. Luke was a disciple of Paul. Mark was a disciple of Peter. And so we find that Peter may have led Mark to the faith since he refers to him affectionately as his son in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. The ecclesia, the church that is at Babylon. Now, this word Babylon, it is not clear what he's referring to because they, they weren't necessarily in Babylon as we know, but we know that there are times when Jerusalem, Israel, is referred to as Babylon. Rome was referred to in this day as a type of Babylon. Egypt, to some, is referred to as a type of Babylon, just like many today refer to the world as Egypt. You know, coming out of Egypt is coming out of the world, <laughs> as we used to say when we were in the church. And so, He's saying, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, salute you, and so doth Marcus, my son. And so Marcus was the, the name of Mark, the one who wrote the gospel of Mark. So going back to 1 Peter. So now we've got a I, idea of who Peter was. He was called Simon. He was called Peter. He was called Simon Peter. He was called Simon by Jonah. He was called Cephas. And he was called, what? Simeon. So he was referred to by these six names. He was born in Bethsaida. He lived in Capernaum. And he seemingly relocated because we find the gospel, uh, I mean the book of Acts, where now he's in Jerusalem. That's where his headquarters is. We see that he was married, that he um, more than likely took his wife on mission trips when he went on missionary journeys to take the gospel of Yeshua to the world. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 2, we've identified that Peter is writing to Pontus. He's writing to strangers. And we're going to see the, the, the strangers are those who are in a place that they weren't born in. Now, many of these individuals were scattered. They were scattered fleeing persecution. We identified that the persecution in Acts chapter 8, and then some who, who um, lived in particular areas who came up for the actual feast. When we look at Acts chapter number 2, in Acts chapter 2, we can find some of those places that he's writing to. In Acts chapter 2, it says, And these that came up, men from every tongue, they were Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and we find this word Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and then we see Cappadocia, and we see Pontus, and Asia, and Phygia, and these are some of the names of the places that we see that Paul is writing to, or Peter is writing to, in the very first uh, verse of his writing. And so where, where are some of the places Peter is writing to? He's writing to the folks in, let's get back there, here we go, Pontus, Galatia. Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so we can find Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia here in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse number 9. So some of these people came from those areas up to Jerusalem, and it indicates that they were Hebrew or Judeans who came up to the feast. So now Peter is writing to these and he calls them strangers. 
Strangers are people from one place who lives in another place, and this is how he's referring to them, to the strangers who are scattered. But then he uses this word scattered as if they were either scattered by the Almighty, scattered by persecution, or they just simply went. We don't know, but we know that there was a scattering that took place. We also know that there was persecution that continued to come to the Israelites, especially the followers of Yeshua, and some of the persecution that they were experiencing was from the religious leaders in Judaism. Peter, or Paul, was one of those leaders who was searching for believers in Yeshua to take them to prison and to try to drive the faith once delivered to the saints out of the land of Israel and even out of surrounding countries. So, when we get to verse number 2 of First Peter, we find that he says, elect, this word elect, according to the foreknowledge of Elohim the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of, of the blood of Yeshua Messiah. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now, this is a mouthful. Peter refers to these strangers as elect. These are ones that are chosen. He says that these elect was chosen according to the foreknowledge of Elohim the Father. And how did he choose them? He chose them through setting apart sanctification of the Spirit. For what? for obedience unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua Messiah. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. When we look at this word elect, we find that this is one who's picked out, one who is chosen. Chosen by whom? By Elohim. How? To obtain salvation through Messiah. Now what's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is that we know that throughout history, the Almighty has always had a remnant of individuals that have been selected and this, this term that Peter used here is, ver in verse 2, he says, according to the foreknowledge. According to the foreknowledge. It is, it is difficult sometimes looking at the Bible, knowing the heart of the Almighty, and seeing the condition of the world and knowing that there will be people that were put here by the Almighty who would reject the Almighty and would go to their grave rejecting and denying his sovereignty over their lives. And this is a very unfortunate thing. The Almighty knows the end from the beginning. And with knowing the end from the beginning, it is not difficult for the Almighty to know even before someone is consumed or, or someone is conceived, knowing whether this person will spend the rest of their lives in obedience or in disobedience. Now, the Bible says that Judas was chosen and he was chosen for a purpose and this purpose was to aid Messiah in getting to his destination but he was referred to as the son of perdition. Father, through his foreknowledge, could see the end from the beginning and through his plan, work his plan through individuals who have already decided in their life before they were born over the course of their life that they're not going to serve the Almighty. There are people, ladies and gentlemen, that no matter how much we preach to them, they're just not going to come around. Now, the good news for us is we don't know who they are. That's good news for me 
Because if I knew who they were, I wouldn't waste my time with them. However, just as Judas had a purpose, the unbelievers that we spend our energy on teach us things. There is not an unbeliever that I have ministered to that I haven't learned something. The wisdom, ladies and gentlemen, is knowing when to shake the dust. <laughs> That's the wisdom, is knowing when to shake the dust. And Yeshua taught his disciples how to discern when to shake the dust through watching him, following him, and seeing how he dealt with individuals, especially hard-hearted individuals, knowing that some of the individuals that he dealt with not only didn't like him, wasn't going to accept him, but was going to do everything they could to not only stop him, but to ultimately take his life. You have to know them who labor among you, whether they're labor, laboring in vain or laboring for Messiah. There are people who are doing certain things for their own sake, not for the kingdom's sake. And we have to be able to recognize and discern. Otherwise, there's a term that I used to call, it, you know, these, these bleeding heart saints. See, there are bleeding heart saints who want to help everybody. And there are people that we should help as the Spirit leads us. But there are some people that we're not supposed to help. And we have to know the difference. You have to know there are people that are designed the Almighty has put them and the enemy uses them and their entire purpose is to wear you out. Their goal, their purpose is to frustrate you. They will wear you and wear you and wear you and wear you out till you're good for nothing. You're tired. You come to a place to where, you know what? I, I, I'm just tired. I, I keep trying to lead people to, to Jesus and they won't go. Well, you know, you have to know, like Yeshua says, when to shake the dust. Why is it? See, people, pride and ego also get in the mix of trying to do evangelism work. Because if you're trying to get a notch in your belt, and some people, they say, well, I'm not doing it for that. But you have to check your own motives. You have to know your own heart. You have to know when to say no. Like the old song, songwriter, you have to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, <laughs> know when to run. Because there's some people I'm telling you, the Bible tells us that the devil is going to wear the saints out. He's going to try to wear the saints out. And the devil uses people. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And so we have to learn how to discern. We have to learn how to be led by the Spirit. We have to learn how to know them that labor among us. And there are people who labor among us who are not with us. There are tares among wheat. You got to know the wheat from the tares. And it's not so you can separate them out. Just know who they are. <laughs> because the Almighty says you got to let the wheat grow up with the tare. The tare look like wheat. <laughs> And they grow up right among you. And you have to be able to recognize them, not to drive them out, not to weed them out, not to push them out, not to run them off. Just simply know them. Because there's some people, you know, they think that, you know, they come to the house of Israel and I'm supposed to be their friend. You know, you're supposed to go out and, and, and have lunch with. Listen, if you think that I'm going to be sitting around drinking beers with you singing Kumbaya, you got another thing coming. It ain't going to happen. But well, what Why you won't spend no time? And they come, I've had people say, you know, I've, I come here and you, you've said something to me twice. It's like you expect me to sit down and talk to you every time you come here. Listen, folks, that ain't going to happen. It, it's not going to happen. There's plenty of people out here 
to, to, to build relationship with. Right? A whole bunch of people. That's called body. Everybody's not supposed to be my friend. I mean, you know, in Messiah, yeah. But hanging out, buddies, truth be, be told, I'm a loner. And it's not that I'm a loner because I want to be a loner. It's the things that Father is doing in me. Sometimes I'm too weird for you to be hanging out with. I'm a party pooper by, by many standards. See, I call stuff out. And you can't be having fun with people calling you out all the time. It's like, man, dang. I'm sorry, my wife said I use that word too much. <laughs> it's like, leave me alone. Why don't you go over there somewhere? Let us over here see. We want to play cards and talk trash and cheat. <laughs> said, <laughs> so, no, I'm not the one. And so he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of Elohim, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua Messiah. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. The word ecclesia or ec, uh, elect is eclectos, picked out, chosen, chosen by Elohim to obtain salvation through Messiah. And then, the word there is used 16 times as elect chosen seven times. The word sanctification is consecration, purification, the effect of consecration, sanctification of heart and life. Excuse me. And Paul, uh, Peter, is going to get into this idea of holiness. Now, we did a teaching on be ye holy. And, and Peter is big on the idea that the believers are supposed to be holy. And we're going to see that as we read his, go through his, his writing. And this is to bring us, we're sanctified by the Spirit unto obedience. That is to obey. And, and we're going to find out what it is we're supposed to be obeying. And this word here, through the sprinkling of blood, is the word purification. A sprinkling by purification appointed for sprinkling and we can connect that to what happened in the wilderness with Moses as he took the blood and sprinkled the people and, and, and purified the people. And so we can see that Yeshua, through his sacrifice of shedding blood, sanctifies us, purifies, and consecrates us, and make us holy by his spirit unto obedience. And this is what Peter is saying here. And then we look at the Hebrew writer, and we'll close with these verses. But but Messiah being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. The Hebrew captures this as we see in verse 9. It says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and in the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so what is he saying here? The Hebrew writer is saying, listen, even when you did those sacrifices, you still retain this information in your head. You ever notice that when you do something that you know is wrong, even though you've been forgiven by the Almighty, how it kind of stays with us? And the forgiveness the, and the cleansing seems too easy. It's as if we have to suffer. And sometimes we inflict suffering on ourselves because the forgiveness of the Almighty seems too easy. But it is just what he says. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And then we're, we're going to pick up here next week. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua Messiah, which according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Messiah Christ, or Messiah Yeshua, from the dead. And this is what we'll pick up next week.
And so what Paul, what Peter does, and I keep saying Paul, but what Peter does is that in the first couple of verses, he identify who he is, called to be an apostle. He identify his audience, who he's writing to. And then he begins to lay the foundation as to who they're supposed to be. And then he's going to begin to lay out as we continue on next week, the what Messiah did for us and how we're supposed to live this out in our daily lives. What we're going to find about Peter is Peter is big on how you live every day. How you live every day. Unfortunately, for some reason or another, um, apostolic and prophetic type organizations have put us in a mindset of looking to the future. Looking you know, for what is to come down the road and oftentimes ignoring how we are to live today. The thing that I, I, I appreciate, especially through a process going through the anonymous, whether it be Narcotic Anonymous or Alcoholic Anonymous, is the focus is on day by day, how you live today. See, take no thought of your life don't worry about tomorrow. And though we may make plans, nobody can fulfill those plans if Messiah doesn't, by the Spirit, allow us. And so we can't say what we're going to do next year, except it be his will. So what we are to do is I have to make sure that I'm living right today. And then tomorrow, I have to make sure that I'm living right today. And then the next day, I have to make sure that I'm living right today. You see, every day, I have to make sure that I'm living right today. And this is, this is what P Peter focuses on, is how are you living today? See, yesterday is behind us. We can learn from the mistakes of yesterday so we don't repeat them. I can't live tomorrow. I just can't. No matter how much I want to, I remember when I was a child, young person, I can't wait till I get 18 years old. You know, and your years just go by, and now you kind of wish you can go back and get some of those years by the time you get 58. <laughs> like, man, where did all the years go? Well, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to hurry up and get to a particular year, and now that it's, it's, it's like zoom. You know, you, you want to get 18. 18 came and went so fast. <laughs> 21 came and went so fast, and the days are still going by. I mean, here we are in December. It seems like we just had Passover celebration. You know, the sukkah came, went up and came down the next day, it seems like. Time is just moving, moving. And so we have to make sure that we're focused on the now. We're focused on today, and we're living our lives today as if today is the day that Yeshua will come. And that's the thing that Peter does, is that he keeps us focused on the here and now, not the great by and by. The church taught us to focus, look for the rapture, look for the rapture. Now that you're saved, just wait for the rapture, the rapture, the rapture, the rapture. And in the meantime, people were living raggedy lives. And, and Peter and Yeshua are saying, listen, no, today, tomorrow is not promising. Today, take no thought of tomorrow. Today, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day that we're to focus on. And then tomorrow we get up. And we get to do it all over again. Amen. Father, we thank you for our time here tonight. We pray your blessings upon the short lesson that we received, the overview, the introduction. And we pray that as we continue in this letter that Peter wrote, that you will give us wisdom and insight on how we are to live holy each day, one day at a time. Blessed be your name in Yeshua. Amen. Shalom, saints. Tithing and giving first fruit offerings are critical parts of the believer's faith
and has its foundation back in Genesis 4-4, when Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And Jehovah had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Abel was commended by Jehovah in Hebrews 11:4, where it states that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, Honor Jehovah with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. The prophet Malachi wrote in chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, to bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now, he with, says Jehovah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says Jehovah of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith Jehovah of hosts. When we tithe and give offerings consistently in obedience to Jehovah's commandments, we can count on him to keep his promises to us and consistently meet all of our needs. It is our Father's desire to bless you. However, it begins with you and your act of obedience to tithe and give offerings. Do it today. Shalom. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888-888. 899-1479. House of Israel International Services is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Thank you.